Heavenly Father, we kneel before you this morning with many things to be thankful for. Thank you for the sound snow. And I know I was surprised this morning when I got up and see the beautiful white ground where it's normally, with no snow, it's kind of gray. But we thank you for that beautiful snow. We thank you for the Sabbath and for the chance to get, a, get away from our normal routine. Also today, we want to thank you for our schools, and we pray that you will be with a teacher in front of our students, in front and neck, and also at the academy. And I pray for the students that are here, that they will learn their lessons well. And I think of their parents who are struggling hard to keep them here, and I pray that they will be encouraged as their students grow. There are requests today, you've heard them. There's a grandfather that needs your care, and a father, and also family members. We're so thankful for them. And as a church, we're thankful for our young people that have come and worship with us, bring us a lot of joy. So we thank these things in your blessed name, Jesus, and I pray that you will be with our speaker today. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a special treat today. Amberlyn and Jody. Let me try that one more time. You got this. This is the air I
Thank you so much. It was beautiful. It's time to turn to our scripture reading today, Philippians 4, verse 8. Philippians 4, verse 8 reads, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatever th things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is any praise, Meditate on these things. Dr. Booth, the time is yours. Well, I usually talk to the group that's the age, the average, the mean average of age, so I guess that's uh, somewhere between, what, 13 and 18 here. Young folks carry the day again, folks. Um, so, when's the last, next time you guys are going to go skiing? February? Next Thursday. Hmm. It's been about four years since I went. I, I used to ski, and my son said, oh, no, you have to snowboard. And I said, that looks wicked scary, because whoever heard of bolting your feet in, I mean, at least in skiing, you can get your feet out, right? Then I tried snowboarding. Uh, I, I, I don't even know where my skis are anymore. So snowboarding is it, yes. So, so I'm going to come. Now, you've got to understand something about Miss Mary Bell. She thinks that any sport that's done on water is dangerous. Snow is water, right? I won't drown, but I might break my neck, right? Yeah. She'll pray for me while I'm out there. So how many of you did the... Uh, fasting thing. How many of you fasted? You're kidding. Wow, I thought I might see six hands. You fasted. How long did you fast? No joke. What's the longest I've ever fasted? Do you? Before I met her, I never did fast, but you know, she does it now and then, so I, I join her. Um, what's the longest anybody has ever fasted? Is this it? Is this your first time? Anybody go, go 24 hours? Raise your hand. Okay, anybody 36 hours? 24, uh, 48 hours? 48 hours. That's when you were a nom, right? No, okay. <laughs> wow, that's, that's a long time, 48 hours. I don't know if I could do that. Well, we're not going to talk about fasting today. We're going to talk about something else, which I know... is something that you think about all the time. We're going to call it the Samson effect, okay? What's the Samson effect? Hmm. I just called a friend last night, and he told me, um, he asked me what I was going to do today, what I was going to speak on, and I said, it's going to be called the Samson effect. He said, wow, that would make a good book title. I thought, yeah, I probably would. So maybe I need to do that. The Samson Effect. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Judges. On this PowerPoint, I have some sound effects if you hear them. Car tires screeching, glass breaking, things like that. It's to keep you awake in case you start to fall asleep, okay? Or maybe it's to keep me awake in case I start to fall asleep. Judges, book of Judges, chapter 13. This uh, mic keeps cutting out on me. That's okay. I'm sorry. Judges chapter 14. This is one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. Not because it has a good ending. Because it doesn't. I've tried and tried and tried to make the story of Samson be a, a nice story that I could I write in a book. Some of my friends write these kinds of stories. I don't write them. My stories, you got to have something redemptive at the end to make it turn out so that you say, oh, there's hope. If I messed up, there is hope. The story of Samson does not turn out well, but we're not going to talk about the end. We're going to talk about the beginning. 
since you now are at the beginning of your life, so to speak, for all the older folks looking at you guys, they say, wow, you're just babies. Really, when it comes to relationships, you're just very, very young. So let's take a look at what happened to Samson at the very start when he was thinking about what he wanted for relationships with women. Okay, so ladies, this is not just for men. This is for you too. We have other stories in the Bible about women who chose well and women who didn't chose, choose so well. So let's read it. Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw in Timnah a daughter of the Philistines. So he went up to his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as a wife. Would you do that? Would you go to your father and say, Oh, Father dear, I pray thee, get me this woman to wife, for she pleases me. Well. Would you say that? Well, why not? Well, if you've ever watched Fiddler on the Roof, anybody ever watched Fiddler on the Roof? Okay. I know, it's a musical. Some people, um, Miss Maribel doesn't care for musicals so much. I don't know, that one kind of gets long. But um, three different stories about young women who are choosing men. And, you know, you're not going to ask your father to do it for you. Probably do it yourself, right? Yeah. yeah. And maybe even if he doesn't like the girl. Today we do that. We don't ask permission. I think it might be wise, but we don't always ask for permission. Here he is asking his mother and father for permission. Today he wouldn't do that. But in those days, the mother and father set up the wedding. You couldn't get married unless you went and made a deal with the parents. Like, I don't know, it was money, folks. I mean, <laughs> you know, you pulled out your wallet and you said, so... How much do I have to pay? And the guy would say, well, how much you got? Pretty sad, ladies. Now, I don't think it meant that you weren't worth something. It just meant that's the way they did things in those days. Some places in the world where it's a little better than others. We'd like to think we've got the best culture here in America. I don't know. See a lot of broken marriages out there, so I'm just thinking a lot of young people did not ask their parents I don't think Samson was asking. I think he was telling. All right, next verse. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me. Repeat after me. For she pleases me well. Wow. Okay, what's that mean? This lady is hot. Get her, Pa. And her father says, uh, Can't you find someone among your own people? I mean, I don't think the Philistines were the model for how you want to dress. Now, there's something about the Philistines maybe you didn't know. The thing about the Philistines that seemed cool was the Philistines were cool. The Philistines had the latest of everything. So if you didn't have a flat screen TV in your culture, you'd go over to the Philistines because they got them. Okay? If you didn't have an iPhone, you'd go over to Philistine country because they got them. If you didn't have a Porsche in your culture, you'd go over to the coast where the Philistines all hung out because they had them. The Philistines were the most superior culture in that part of the world at that time. Not just with weapons, but in the way they made their pottery, the kinds of, they built theaters, they, they were just so sophisticated. And the Israelites were living like, Samson was probably living in a cave. I'm not kidding. Samson was living in a cave, not even in a tent. Because he and his mother and father were hiding from the Philistines. Because the Philistines had driven them clear up in the hill country. So now he looks at the Philistines and he says, Wow, these people drove me and my people out of our homes. They're really cool. I think I'll go down there and get me a woman. Get me that woman, Father, for she pleases me well. <laughs> His mother and father should have said, Are you kidding? These guys run us out of our home. You don't even have a bed to sleep on now. You want to go down and see the Philistines? You know, it's kind of sad, isn't it? Paul tells us, Sometimes we have to be real realistic in our spiritual experience because the things that we do look foolish to the world. But the things that the people do in the world kind of look foolish to us. If you ask me, I don't think Samson made a very good choice. But I'm not Samson. 
If you had all the strength in the world, guys, you could get any woman in the United States of America, where would you go? Hollywood? I think some of us would go there. Ladies, where would you go if you had the most gorgeous face in the universe and you just won American Idol and all some of the other things that you might think about? Where would you go to get a guy? Thailand. Thailand. All right. <laughs> These guys are from Thailand. All right. Yeah. Think about this, folks, because guess what? You're on the doorstep the rest of your life. It's time for you to start thinking, who will I choose to be my companions? Maybe you're not thinking about marriage yet, but you know, you are as your friends are, okay? My mother used to say that, and I have to agree with her. Now, guys, if you looked like this, you'd probably be saying this. I want it, Father. Get it for me. It pleases me well. Give me stuff, you know. Give me video games. Give me a car. Give me something that I don't have. Ladies, I don't know. That's the Barbie look, right? Okay. I don't think Delilah probably looked like that. But probably her skin was a little darker. I don't know. Not only do we want it all, we want it now. now. Does that sound make that make sense? Well, guess what? Your parents are guilty of it too. Right? That's why they have credit cards. Because they want it now. Actually, we're the ones that taught you this phrase. It's not a very nice phrase because it says, I am not a patient man. I am not a patient woman. If I want something, I will get it now. Get it for me, Father, for it pleases me well. Get it for me, Mom. Why are you keeping me waiting? So let's do a little funny thing today. I could have given you the papers today and handed them out, but yeah, we're kind of lacking on time. You've got to get back over to the gym so you can stop eating again. If you were going to write a little ad for yourself in the local, I don't know, dating magazine, put it online, let's say, the online dating columns, and you were going to write an ad for yourself, and you had five little descriptors of yourself, what would you say? This is for you older folks, too, in case there's any of you who have been thinking about doing this. <laughs> yeah. If you're married, of course, it doesn't apply, but uh, maybe you're hoping to appeal to some employer out there, right? All right, guys, think about it. Who's brave? Give me a word you would use to describe yourself. Mr. President. He thinks I don't know his name, Eric. Well, today he forgot my name. So, you know what? I got the last word. So, give me a word to describe you, Mr. President. Handsome. handsome. <laughs> okay, good. So, you put the word handsome there. Oh, if I, I, I teach a class in this, in psychology, you would not believe. Or maybe you would. I could not believe some of the phrases I saw of people to describe themselves. I said, you got to be kidding. This person really wrote this about themselves? Well, how many of you think you're handsome here? Guys, raise your hand. Be brave. Okay, ladies, how many of you think you're beautiful? She said to say what? Say what? <laughs> All right, so did you know that 90% of young people who were polled said, yeah, I'm above average in looks. Think about that. 90% said, I'm above average. Wait a minute. I thought average was like the mean, like 50. <laughs> you can't all be gorgeous. Well, maybe this group can be. Maybe this is a select group. Folks, take your talking points from these guys and ladies. <laughs> right in your mind now, don't worry, I'll come back to the campus and I'll do this for real with you, okay? We'll do it for a Sabbath school program. We'll get you to be honest. Not that you're actually trying to get somebody out there, but if you were and you wrote five descriptors for yourself on a dating page somewhere online, that's where it's most often done now, 
five short expressions or words, what would you say about yourself? We'll do it again sometime, okay? So be thinking. Be thinking about this. Years ago, there was a game on TV called The Dating Game. You ever see the reruns of it? Anybody see it? Okay. It's kind of hokey to me. It's always, I thought it was kind of stupid in the day when I watched it. Now I really think it's stupid. Not, not that it's a dumb idea. Actually, it's a pretty good idea. It's how the people acted. That was real, the real thing. You know, That was the first reality TV because those people didn't know who they were going to meet. Okay, now let's turn away from yourself. And let's look at the people around you. Okay? If you had the opportunity to choose the ideal date, or I know you guys don't date anymore, you just kind of hang out, or I don't know what they call it now, but if you were going to choose somebody for a date, what traits would you look for? Be honest. What's, your, what's most important to you when you're dating someone? Some people say, well, I'm not really marrying them so what's wrong with dating them even if they don't have the ideal character trait what would you look for honesty <laughs> <laughs> she's shy that's good she's looking for somebody shy out there okay then there came another show this one was called the newlywed game have you ever seen it okay i also do that version I have a version of dating game and a version of the newlywed game for Christians. Because the shows on TV were not for Christians. And we'll do that one here also sometime. Okay? Uh-oh. You aren't going to get married. Don't worry. We have a Bible version of this too that we do for husbands and wives of the Bible. That's kind of fun. If you had the opportunity to choose the ideal mate, that means somebody you are choosing to live with the rest of your life. What would you be looking for? Well, wait a minute. Hmm. Let's go backwards. Would this be the same person you chose for this? I remember one guy at the university in Thailand. We asked him this question. He said, I don't want to date a Christian girl. They're no fun. And I said, say what? Do you know the same Christian girls that I know? I don't think he was looking for God. So, what is most important to you when you look for someone who's a friend or possibly somebody who might be a date for life? That's what I say. I keep, I keep dating my wife. I say, wait a minute. I thought, you were, I thought you were already married. Yes, I am. But if you don't keep dating your spouse then they might forget you're married see so you don't want to do that you want to keep taking them out on dates keep romancing them so that they won't forget that you love them now if you're choosing a mate for life or a serious friend which of these terms which of these things do you think you would choose first that's what i was doing all the way here this morning by the way this road was so I see uh, Miss Mary Bell thought I was going to crash into a pole or something. Okay, look at these terms. Which of these do you think are most important to you? What if I told you you could only choose three? Let's say I was, I was God today and I came to you and I said, choose three descriptors of the person you will live with for the rest of your life. Ah, you'd probably run away, right? Okay. That's what some people do. Choose three. In your mind, be honest now. Choose three. Only three. Adults out there, you might want to think about the one sitting beside you and say, how many of these things that I chose when I first got married are still the same? Well, no. if you're looking for somebody with hair, it ain't me. Okay, which ones are most important to you? Now, just because you don't pick the same one as the guy or the lady sitting next to you doesn't mean it's not important. It might be, but it might not be, okay? What's most important to you? All right. 
<laughs> kind of scary, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen next, right? Trust me, for every one of these you pick, there's a good reason not to pick it. And I don't mean in my eyes. I mean in society's eyes, every one of these looks like it's going to be an advantage. I mean, somebody who's taller, right? I mean, guys, do you like to be tall? My son said, oh, I hate it. I'm six foot. Why didn't God make me 5'8 so that nobody would expect me to dunk the ball? Now they see me six foot, they think I can dunk the ball. Well, he can, but boy, he has to really bend that rim. So he said, why couldn't I have been at least six foot three? I said, what are you complaining about? The average man in the world is still five foot seven. Ladies, how about really nice hair? Is hair a thing, big thing with you? You know, Paul says, a woman's glory is her hair. So then I have to ask you, why do these guys all keep putting braids in their head and, you know, I don't know. Long hair is supposed to be a lady thing, okay? Okay, ladies, did you pick a good job? The person has to have a good job. How many of you picked that? You picked that. Okay, so the guy you're going to get has to have a good job. Okay, she's probably going to be the richest young lady here because if you didn't pick that, that means you're willing to settle for the guy who just sits on the couch all day playing PlayStation. Yeah. Smart woman. Educated. How many of you picked educated? Very wise. You better pick somebody who's educated. I'm telling you, in the next 20 years, if you don't pick someone who's educated, they are going to be out doing the things you don't want to do. As somebody said once, do you want to pump the gas into the car or do you want to design the car? There you go. That's what education does for you. Okay? So pick wisely. Choose wisely. All right. Here's what the stats say in research. If you think you are average or you think you think like the rest of the people in the world, you may relate to this. Guys, on all the research they've done, when men are picking women, they always pick somebody who is younger. Now, not always, but the average person picks somebody who is anywhere from 1 to 10 years younger than them. Not just in the United States, but the world over. Ladies, the average lady picks somebody older. You say, well, that's a good thing. If the guy's picking younger, I have to be younger, and so he better be older, right? <laughs> well, there's the average guy that, you know, says, oh, I don't know. I like older, an older woman who's, you know, making a lot of money and, you know. And appearance. Men, nine times out of ten picked a woman who was better looking they did not look at the woman for what she didn't have. They looked for her beauty, her facial beauty, the figure that she has, the hair. By the way, ladies, did you know that the number one thing that a man looks for in a woman is how she keeps her hair? Did you know that? 44% 44 of all men said the hair is the first thing I look at. If she takes care of her hair, she must be a classy woman. And then it breaks down from there. Ladies picked the guy who was financially secure. If he had money, she went for him. Well, you know, he doesn't go to church every week, but he's got lots of money, so I know I'll be secure. Nine times out of ten, women picked a guy who had money. <coughs> Men, in looking for a wife, looked for somebody who was chaste. That means somebody who had never slept with someone else. They had saved themselves for marriage. The guys, when they get ready to get married, are choosing a woman who is pure. Wait a minute. If that's the case, then why are these men living a life that does not agree with that? Because ah, they have a double standard. Watch out for those guys, ladies. And ladies, they've picked somebody who's ambitious, somebody who wasn't afraid to try something, get out and do something new, make some money, take a little risk, go snowboarding, whatever. If he sits around with his PlayStation all the time and never gets out to do snowboarding, average woman said, eh, he's getting too old for me. We want it all. Someone once said, one lady that was asked said, this is what I'd like to have in a man. I wish he had money. I wish he was beautiful or, or buff or youthful. He has to be funny. He has to be educated. He has to have all of these things. 
Trust me, that's what you're thinking now. By the time you're 50, you won't be thinking about all these things. <laughs> one funny thing that I, one funny little reading that I found online. By the time you're 70 and 80, all you want is a man who's still breathing, you know. <laughs> Every year that goes by, it's, it's something less. You keep taking something off the list, and finally, you go in, oh, he's still breathing. It's okay. I'm still breathing, honey. Okay. <laughs> All right, what else does research tell us? Let's say you think you're a strong person. Let's say you say, I think I have good standards and I have good values, but it doesn't hurt to play around a little. I know what I'm doing. I'm safe. I won't fall for that game out there. Well, here's what the research tells us. If you find yourself in any one of these three categories, you are likely to fall. First one is proximity. How close are you to the person that you admire or you wish you could have a relationship with? How close? Where you work, in your classes, maybe even at church. You gotta watch out. Even at church, sometimes people don't choose well. Number two, similar values. What is your most important thing in life? What do you say is, I got to have that. If I can have that, I'm a happy person. Well, values could be anything from sports to education. Could be your prayer life. When I met Miss Marybell, uh, one of the things that I found about her that was most striking was she had an intense prayer life. Very spiritual person. No matter what I did, she's always spiritual. That to me, it was very important. And the last one is frequency of time. How often are you around that person? So if you work somewhere in an office building, proximity is close, but you don't spend much time with them because their, work, their workstation is far over here. Chances are it won't happen. But if you do something with that person on a regular basis, like go to lunch with them, ride in the same car. Those are the people you probably will develop a relationship with. So be careful. You might think you're choosing well, but remember, if you're doing these three things, you're near them all the time, you have the same values, and you do it often. Those are the three things that are likely to, to help make you choose something you might not really want to choose. And my last illustration for you is that we have a chart here that shows you all the different kinds of love. Let's be honest here today, folks. How many of you feel like you've experienced true love? What's the question she had to say? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. There was a movie once called Princess Bride, right? I mean, I'm going to draw an illustration from it. One of the five most, what was it? Romantic kisses the world has ever known, right? And she had one of them right there. Wow. I'm not sure that's real love, but for, for the sake of our illustration, which of these kinds of love do you think is most important? If you were going to choose one of them to work for you today, which one would it be? Now, the older folks probably have seen this before and probably experienced it many times, but the problem in our lives is if we're not careful... We need to be right here, right in the middle. And with God in your life, you can be right in the middle. That means you're going to get the best of all worlds. I think some people sometimes say, well, man, man, if I let God choose my mate for life, it's not going to be any fun. And, you know, this person won't be handsome. And she won't have any money because she'll give it all to the church, right? I mean, we think that's what God's going to do to us. Are you kidding me? God invented this whole picture. He knows what he's doing. God doesn't make mistakes, folks. And remember, the person you marry is the one you go to eternity with. You get to spend the rest of eternity with that person. I mean, is that happily ever after or what? Yeah. The four corners, intimacy, passion, and commitment. Some people just want the intimacy. They just want the sex. Some people just want the passion. I'm sorry, passion down here is the sex. Intimacy, I just want to be close. I want somebody I can tell my secrets to and they won't tell anybody. So that could be a guy. It could be a girl. And then we have commitment. 
yeah, but am I going to stay with that person? You know, all through high school and college, I hardly dated much because I didn't have any money. And I said, you don't have any money. What are you going to do when you go on a date, you know? You're going to look at the ducks in the pond? And you have to buy the bread, and I don't have any money, so let's forget it, right? So I didn't even get to do the commitment part because I didn't have money. If you have all three, of course, you're going to have what's called consummate love. Now, whether you have the other three in the corners, romantic love, companion love, and fatuous love. Kind of similar to the ones we just talked about, but a little bit different. Romantic love is you just find yourself looking at them a lot. You know, it's like something's wrong. You're kind of hypnotized, you know. You know, I've seen this cobras, what they do. They go like this, and the, and the dumb little rabbit's going, I mean, he's not in love, right? <laughs> but he gets caught up in that hypnotic state. Same thing happens to the human mind. You're going to get caught up in what we call romantic love because it feels so good. Wow. Okay, I've dated people, guys before, but this guy, wow. And then there's the companionate love, right? The companionate love is the love where you say, wow, this is my soulmate. I feel like this person understands me. Well, guess what? If that's the only one you're looking at, you will not have a happy marriage because other things are going to go wrong. Companionship's wonderful, but God knew we needed more. Fatuous love. That's the one that's related to sexuality. That's the one that says, wow, this person is so good looking. You get drawn and attracted to them physically. Okay? This one here is temporary. This one here is what you develop over time. Romantic love with your spouse. By the way, people who date never really have romantic love. You don't really fall in love with the person you date. You're really not in love with the person until after you marry them. I call it, I fell in like. Yeah, you really, 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 really like that person. You like that person more than anybody else that you know. Wow, I think I'd like to live with you the rest of my life. Why? Because I really like you. Well, can't you just say the other word? You know, in Happy Days, I don't know if you watch reruns of Happy Days, and Fonzie could never say, I l l l he couldn't say it. I l yeah, that word. You know, he couldn't say it. So those who grow old in love together really, really become romantic. But the fatuous part is the temporary part. All right. Type A's, type B's, won't take a lot of time about this, but if you're a type A individual and you marry another type A individual, there's going to be sparks. It's going to be 4th of July every day. And I don't know about you, I can't take fireworks every day. A lot of days, just not every day. If you're both type B, you may never get off the couch. And that's good for you if you want to be poor the rest of your life. And then there's the other theory that says, well, I think I'm one of these. If you marry somebody who is in your bracket, melancholy or choleric, both choleric people bossing each other around, you drive each other crazy. Wait a minute. We can't both be the boss here. Okay, then I'll be the boss. You know, then you fight about who's going to be the boss. You fight about everything because cholerics want their own way. Melancholies, they're the detail people. They're the romantic people. Sit around looking at each other all day long. Phlegmatics, they're the ones that are passive. They don't really make a lot of decisions. They always let somebody else make the decision. Get up for breakfast. What do you want to eat for breakfast? I don't know. What do you want to eat? Don't start that again. We argued about that yesterday. You know, they don't, can't make decisions. Last of all, sanguines. Sanguines just want a party. So by the end of the second day of the month, your paycheck's already spent, and you're poor the rest of the month because all you're thinking about is having fun today, with other people who like to have fun. More than likely, you can be described as one of the people we've discussed today and lots of pieces of them. So which one are you? And what kind of a person will you choose for your date or your mate? And remember, those we seriously date become our mates for life.
Well, I have a verse of scripture for each of you. Guys, I've got one for you. Ladies, I've got one for you. So there you go, ladies. Classic. Look it up. Proverbs 31.10. It's in your Bible. I know. If the hymnal's on the screen, why open the hymnal, right? <laughs> guys, this is yours. Why is the guy's verse longer? Because it takes guys longer to listen. <laughs> ladies get it right off, but guys don't usually. So we give them a little more. The Lord knew what he was doing. He said, to the ladies, who can find a virtuous woman? Parents, who can find a virtuous woman? Are you a virtuous woman, ladies? Can you say, yep, that's me. By God's grace, that is me. I'm a virtuous woman, and I know what I am worth. Guys, this is Solomon talking now, mind you. This is a guy who had a thousand wives. So please try to read it. A little bit tongue-in-cheek. Read it in context. He was trying to tell you, don't make the mistakes I made. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. And I promise you guys, if you choose the right woman, you will have peace and prosperity. If you do not choose the right woman, you might end up with one of the ones that Solomon's talking about. He said, a woman, a nagging woman is like a dripping faucet. Chinese torture. Okay, so choose well. Ladies, don't try to pretend you're something you aren't. If you're a virtuous woman, guess what? That's what guys want to marry. They want the woman who's virtuous. They may not say it by their body language, but it's what they really want. Last of all, I call this the chastity fidelity test, okay? If you can say in your mind, this is what I want to be, and this is what I want my date or my mate to be, if you can say that honestly in your mind, then you also need to remember to not make the mistakes that many of your parents and your uncles and aunts and friends of family have made. Don't marry somebody and try to make them something they are not. What you see is what you get. That makes sense, right? How many of you guys like to change for somebody? They say, well, you're so handsome, but if you combed your hair this way, I would think you were even more handsome. Or ladies, how, how many of you would like it if a guy said, well, you're really nice, but I don't really like that color on you. Why don't you wear a different color? <laughs> well, who died and made you the authority, right? It's just little things. But there's other things that we do to each other all the time. And my last, and the last uh, chastity fidelity test is, don't make the mistake of marrying somebody so you can convert them. Whatever that means. I call them missionary marriages. Why? Because they're not really what you want, but if you could just love them enough, you would be able to make them into this wonderful person. Maybe they're not a Christian, but you know what? I'm so strong. I will make them into a Christian. Do you know how we know that doesn't work? Try putting a rotten apple into a basket of apples. What will happen to all the apples eventually? I don't know how Satan does that, but he always makes bad look good. How does he do that? Bad is good. No, wait. Jesus said, no, no. Bad is not good. You will know a tree by what kind of fruit it bears. Don't choose the bad. Look at the tree. Hello. Is it bearing good fruit? That's what he said. Do we believe him? I hope so. And our verse of Scripture. Is this your verse? We call this the litmus test for choosing wisely. Look at these descriptors, ladies and gentlemen. One of these descriptors is your trait for today that you're looking for, okay? There's traits that are especially chosen by Paul for ladies, and there's ones that are chosen well for the men. Finally, brothers and sisters, I added that in there, thank you. Whatever is true, whatever is noble. If it's not true, don't buy it. When you see an ad for something on, don't you sometimes laugh at some of the ads they put on? Say, what are they? 
what do they think? We're morons? Some of us must be because we're buying the stuff there to sell in. Whatever is noble. Guys, this one's for you. Ladies want to see a noble guy. He's the guy that rides in on the horse. He's got that armor on. Whoosh. And when he smiles, the little light just ding off his tooth, right? I mean, like, wow. Now, maybe you don't like that, that look anymore, the gold tooth look, but that's the noble look. We, ladies all want to see a noble guy. It's a guy who cannot be twisted or turned. He will not do wrong even if the heavens were to fall. And money is not the first order of business. And if this is my guy, he will be faithful to me. He will never look at another woman. That's noble. Is that what you want, ladies? It's what we all want. Whatever is right. Whatever is pure. Lady, this one's for you. Whatever is lovely. Are you lovely? If a guy comes up to you and says, and just tell me why I should date you, and you say, because I'm lovely. That's a good answer. That's a really good answer. Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, if anything is praiseworthy, think about these things and then act on them. Don't make your decisions based on whims. Don't decide, well, I know what I should do. I know what my mom and dad are telling me to do. I know what the church says, but I'm going to do it my own way. And in the end, everything will turn out perfect and I'll live happily ever after. No, you won't. Check out Samson's story. We have no stories in the Bible where people who made bad choices and it turned out good. No stories. Because if you choose what's evil, you will not become a good person. And you will not get a good person. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us these wise words today in your scriptures. We know, Lord, there's something for each of us in the Bible. All we have to do is open it up and look. And, Lord, today we want to listen to your voice. We know that there may be someone in this room that is just the right person for us, Lord. And maybe it won't happen here. Maybe it'll happen sometime in college, or maybe sometime when we get out of college, but someday that person's going to come that just hits the sweet spot, Lord. And we're not ready to get married now, of course, but Lord, we start forming our preferences now. Please help us to choose wisely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hymns number 567, have thine own way, Lord. It's all stand. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. 
have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, wounded and weary, help me, I pray, power of power, sure thee is thine, touch me and heal me, Savior Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit, till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Let's bow our heads one more time. Father, we are so glad that we are young today. We have youth, Lord, on our side. We have so much to look forward to. I pray, Lord, that as we leave this service in your house, that we will take your spirit, your angels with us. Help us, Lord, to make good decisions. May we be like Jesus. And may those who look at us see Jesus in our face. In his name we pray, amen. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. We alone imparts faith in the promise of his word we believe the time is here when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing hallelujah Christ is king we this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the 